Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I imagine that by now many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? It's scheduled for release on June 1st this year and advance orders are already available on Amazon. If you click on the link in the upper right of your screen, you'll be able to go directly to our listings page, the page that lists all of our programs. From there, you can see marked in red a link to place your order for our new book. Now, I'm going to show you brief minute to 90 second segments from each of the nine interviews that are edited and transcribed in our new book. The first segment is with Dr. Vernon Nepi, a neuropsychiatrist who presents the remarkable case of a chess game played with the living chess master Victor Korchnoi, who was ranked number two in the world at that time, with a deceased chess master, Geza Meroxi, who died in 1951 and was once ranked number two in the world. Meroxi apparently communicated his moves through a spiritual medium using automatic writing. And of course, in this particular match, Korchnoi did win. Yes, Korchnoi did win. And so this put paid to the idea that, well, you know, uh, if this was going to be fabricated, wouldn't have it been nice if Maroxi one. And you know, it's fascinating when you start looking at how the media talks about it. In fact, mm -hmm. in one of the Bobby Fisher movies, they talked about people who were mad in chess and they pointed to Fisher and they pointed to Steinitz and Wolfgang Steinitz, as far as I remember, uh, way back in the 19th century, announced that he wanted to play God because he said he would beat God. <laughs> in chess. And uh, so you go backwards in time and who was quoted? Poor Korchnoi. But they didn't say he played it. He said there was this chess champion grandmaster, one of the leading players in the world, who claimed he played a ghost. And this is ridiculous. And they made a joke about it. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking at it, Extended survival over a period of time is quite something, and because of it, you've got to look at all the alternative explanations. In the next segment, journalist Leslie Kane, author of Surviving Death, a journalist investigates evidence for an afterlife, shares some intimate experiences she encountered in spiritualist seances with the physical medium Stuart Alexander. On one instance, you write about being in the room. It was totally dark, I gather. But uh, during that session, a full-bodied materialization occurred. And I hope people are not off, turning off the interview at this point. <laughs> but um, this is unbelievable, uh, Jeff. So there's one spirit person who works with Stuart. His name is Dr. Barnett. He's the same one who speaks independently that I was describing earlier. Distinguished British was a, was a doctor when he was here on earth. And he is the one spirit person who materializes fully in the seance room. It doesn't happen that often, but um, I've experienced it maybe three or four times in all the years I've been there. Dr. Eben Alexander, author of Proof of Heaven, was a materialist Harvard neurosurgeon prior to his life-changing near-death experience. When you first 
in effect arrived in this alternative reality, you found yourself sort of embedded in a in an unpleasant uh, muck of of some sort. It all started in what I call the earthworm's eye view. Yeah, uh, like being in dirty jello. And I, I even though I had no body awareness during any part of the journey, mm-hmm. uh, I could still I was a piece of awareness, and I could sense around me. And I remember roots or blood vessels or something that were just mm-hmm. everywhere and. Given that I had no memory moment to moment, it seemed to go for eons, mm. but it didn't. It it ended because there came this slowly spinning, very clear white light mm-hmm. that had fine silvery and golden tendrils off of it. And as that white light came towards me, one of the most beautiful aspects of it, it came packaged with a perfect musical melody. Professor Stafford Betty of the Department of Philosophy and Religion at California State University, Bakersfield, is author of many books about the afterlife. Psychical researchers have been studying mediums and mediumistic communication going back to about the 1850s. That's right. We have over 150 years of research uh, at this point in time, although I think there's still a lot of disagreement amongst the researchers themselves as, as to how reliable this material is. The deeper one goes into the subject, the more reliable it's going to seem. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm one of the persons who's gone most deeply into the subject. What I've done is to brought is to bring together, mm-hmm. is to analyze uh, and bring together oh dozens, dozens, perhaps as many as a hundred different communications from the other side that uh, purport to say to describe the world in which they live. Mm-hmm. I find this a lot more believable and plausible than a scripture which purports to tell us what is on the other side, but it's not written by somebody who's there. Yeah. Uh, I want a witness who uh, can, can speak to me with more authority, and that's what we're getting. Miranda Alcott is a professional animal communicator. I have known her for about a quarter century through our mutual association with the Intuition Network. Well, let's talk a little also about the afterlife mm-hmm. itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a hard time conceptualizing it because it seems as if it's a place, like it has a location somewhere. You know, it's interesting. It depends on the person's belief system mm-hmm. because everyone wants to know that their horse has endless amounts of um uh, grains that they love, yeah. you know, um, alfalfa or whatever their mm-hmm. sweet treat is, Timothy pellets or whatever, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and and with many dogs, people want to see that their dogs are just running on grass and having every kind of ball they want. It it depends on how the human is holding what their idea is. Mm-hmm. I have not found it to be a place. I found it to be a frequency. Uh-huh. It's very different, energetic. Yeah. Dr. Alexander Moira Almeida has conducted extensive research with spiritualist mediums in Brazil. He is author of Science of Life After Death, and he's a psychiatrist. As a psychiatrist, one of the major concerns expressed in the literature has been that people who show mediumistic characteristics are experiencing some form of mental illness. Yes, exactly. Uh, especially in the mid-19th century, in Europe, United States, and even in Brazil, uh, there was a general understanding usually among psychologists and psychiatrists, that um, mediumistic experience and other trans experience would be a cause or a symptom of mental disorders. So we have done studies not only in historical studies from that period, but more recently we are interested in performing psychiatric examinations of mediums and try to see the similarities and differences between mediumistic experience and, for example, psychotic or dissociative disorders. Dr. Betty Kovacs, a Jungian, 
is author of The Miracle of Death, There is Nothing But Life, as well as Merchants of Light, The Consciousness That is Changing the World. The next excerpt refers to communication with her deceased husband, Istvan, and her deceased son, Pisti. You describe Istvan and, and Pishti after their demise as being in another dimension. And my, what I'm curious about is the relationship of that other dimension to what we think of as, as our own consciousness. Well, I think it's all one. I do think it's all one. I think we differentiate it, uh, given our culture and our experience and our lack of experience. I think it is all one. It's perpetually being. And yet, because we live in time and space, we put these things in different spaces and different categories. But uh, as you said, you know, we do have to brush our teeth and buy the groceries and that sort of thing. And I think then we sort of close a certain part off. And as uh, Aldous Huxley had said, you know, there's that valve. We're all born into universal mind. It's always who we are. It's always present. But we have a valve that we have to kind of close down and just allow a trickle of it to flow through so that we can do these things in ordinary daily life. And then it's as though we forgot how to release that valve. <laughs> you know? But if we just release the valve, we are where we've always been. Alan Ross Huguenot was a scientifically trained nautical engineer prior to becoming a spiritualist medium and minister. He is author of The New Science of Consciousness Survival, and the meta-paradigm shift to a conscious universe, as well as the death experience, what is it like when you die? Well, I'm under the impression that time and space are very different over there, and that there's also maybe more important than time and space completely is this dimension of consciousness. I think you referred to it as a vibration. Well, it is. It's a frequency. And uh, a, our, our understanding of consciousness is now moving forward um, on, the, on the cutting edge of, of parapsychology. It's moving forward quite rapidly. We're beginning to, we're making inroads. We're beginning to understand it. And the, that part of the universe is entirely conscious. The consciousness, if you think about what Max Planck said, that that mind is the matrix of matter, matter can't exist except as apprehended consciousness. We bring it in space and time, and it manifests for us, and we see it there. And if you think about the universe as appearing for you from the dark energy, it appears for you, it materializes in front of you uh, the way you wish to see it. And some of that wish is, is corporate. Um, you know, we do it as a whole group of all of us at once, thinking about how we want to see it. And it materializes out of the dark energy, and it, it uh, annihilates, and it comes back. And this is doing it 23 septillion times a second. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, just, it's really vibrating. Michael Cremo is author of Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. In this segment, we discuss Alfred Russell Wallace, co-discoverer with Charles Darwin of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Wallace's scientific interest eventually led him to spiritualism. Alfred Russell Wallace documented many, many dozens of uh, different kinds of manifestations. And for example, ectoplasmic materialization, where uh, a, a spirit being seems to create a, a temporary body out of some mysterious substance called ectoplasm that it seems to be exuded from the body of the medium. He, he did observe things like that. And I think that ultimately he considered that if there are beings, if there are mediums that can do that, that can manifest those ectoplasmic forms, then 
there might be higher beings in the cosmos that originally manifested what we call species, mm -hmm. you know, the various forms that organize, that organisms take. Mm -hmm. He, I think th it was part of his ultimate conclusion about evolution that things like that might also be involved, mm -hmm. which I think is why Darwin became very upset with him. If you've enjoyed these brief segments and would like to order our book, you can use the link in the upper right that will take you to our listings page. From there, you will see, marked in red, the link to order the book. Thank you for being with me. Thank you.